Right here. Look at that. That's unbelievable. It's really, really clever. It's ingenious. These guys were dialed. From being confined within one of the most impenetrable prisons in the world to meticulously orchestrating an escape. From feet, they work their way down the strain pipe. And it's the middle of the night. Middle right? of the night, pitch black, carrying all the gear they've got with them, right? The rack. Here lies the chilling revelation discovered within the tunnels of Alcatraz. Josh finds himself within Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, commonly known as The Rock, situated on Alcatraz Island in the San Francisco Bay, California. Operational from 1934 to 1963, it earned a reputation as a high-security federal prison. Josh delves into investigating the infamous prison break of 1962, guided by the narrative provided by an FBI agent. The story unravels as he sifts through evidence. Although Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was renowned for its supposed escape-proof design, there were notable attempts, though none confirmed as successful. One of the most famed attempts involved three inmates, Frank Morris and brothers John and Clarence Anglin. They endeavored to escape by crafting makeshift rafts and dummy heads to deceive guards during bed checks. Despite an exhaustive search, no conclusive evidence of their survival surfaced leading to the presumption that they perished in the icy waters of San Francisco Bay. The prison boasted six guard towers and over 60 guards, maintaining the highest guard-to-prisoner ratio among prisons in the United States. Its remote location and formidable currents made escape exceedingly daunting, if not seemingly impossible, cementing its reputation as one of the most secure facilities. The myth surrounding Alcatraz's location on an island, encircled by frigid seawater, further fortified its perceived impregnability. Positioned about 1.25 miles from San Francisco's shoreline, even if a prisoner managed to breach its confines, navigating the icy waters with temperatures hovering around 53 degrees was deemed nearly insurmountable. Moreover, the prison administration and guards actively propagated such myths to deter any thoughts of escape. They instilled in prisoners the belief that no one could successfully escape from Alcatraz. Tales of sharks lurking in the sea were spread, implying that any escapee brave enough to brave the cold waters would meet a grim fate as shark bait. Additionally, inmates were led to believe that guards possessed exceptional marksmanship and were under orders to shoot any escapee on sight. Though these claims lacked substantiation, the prison administration persisted in spreading these falsehoods, reinforcing the notion that escape was futile. Through these fabrications, the administration indirectly conveyed to prisoners that they would remain incarcerated until their sentences were served in full. Despite Alcatraz housing some of the nation's most notorious criminals, such as Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly, its stringent security measures failed to extinguish inmates' desires for freedom. Over the years, 14 escape attempts were made, all of which ended in failure, either with the recapture or death of the involved prisoners, except for one infamous exception the escape that tarnished Alcatraz's reputation. This infamous escape involved four inmates, Alan West, Frank Morris, and brothers John and Clarence Anglin. While it's commonly believed that only Morris and the Anglin brothers successfully escaped, West played a pivotal role in planning the breakout. However, a complication arose for West on the night of the escape, which will be addressed later. Prior to this breakout, these four inmates had made multiple escape attempts leading to their transfer to Alcatraz in hopes of quelling further efforts. It was West who initially conceived the idea of escaping. Inmates at Alcatraz were assigned various duties, including cleaning, carpentry, and repairs. One day, while tasked with cleaning the roof above the cells, West noticed a ventilation duct hole leading to the building's roof. Unlike other holes, this one lacked solid concrete covering and had steel rods that were relatively easy to manipulate. Rec recognizing the significance of this discovery, West promptly informed his neighboring inmate, Frank Morris, whose cell was conveniently located near the ventilation hole. Morris, realizing the potential for escape, meticulously crafted a plan. Though the initial spark came from West, it was Morris who emerged as the mastermind due to his exceptional intelligence. Prison records indicated that Morris possessed an IQ of 133 showcasing his remarkable intellect and strategic acumen. With Morris's intellect and West's discovery, the escape plan took shape. Morris enlisted the participation of John and Clarence Anglin, whose cells were adjacent to his own, allowing for constant communication and coordination. 
A crucial aspect of executing their plan involved accessing the ventilation pipe hole discovered by Alan West, situated behind their cells. To reach this point, the inmates needed to navigate through passageways designed for sanitary ducts. Once outside their cells, they could ascend these ducts, reach the ventilation hole, cut the steel rods, and ultimately emerge onto the prison roof. Despite the apparent complexity, Morris, who emerged as the operation leader and mastermind, observed that years of neglect had weakened the prison walls, exacerbated by the corrosive effects of seawater. Exploiting this vulnerability, they embarked on the task of digging through the walls, ingeniously utilizing spoons obtained covertly. Day by day, they chiseled away at the walls, widening the openings, a painstaking process requiring months of dedicated effort. Maintaining secrecy was paramount. The inmates had to remain vigilant, ensuring no guards caught sight or sound of their activities. Allegedly, they conducted their work during designated noisy times, such as the inmates' nightly hours of musical instrument playing, providing cover for their digging efforts. Additionally, they seized opportunities during routine maintenance work within the prison to dig without raising suspicion. Establishing a routine was crucial. They coordinated their digging sessions to coincide with moments when they believed they were out of the guard's line of sight, appointing one among them to keep watch over the corridor, alerting the others to the presence of approaching guards. Given Alcatraz's reputation for stringent security, such caution was essential. Despite the risk of sudden prisoner counts and the knowledge of the escape plan among nearby inmates, no one betrayed the conspirators. In fact, some inmates even lent their support to the endeavor, as solidarity among prisoners was considered a fundamental principle. During the digging process, nearly 80 inmates were reportedly aware of the escape plan. Remarkably, none of them divulged this information to the authorities. To conceal the openings they created, the escapees devised a clever cover-up. To further conceal their activities, they fashioned cardboard planks in the prison workshop, painting them to match the cell walls, securely covering the holes. Additionally, they strategically placed personal belongings such as instruments and clothing in front of the openings to further obscure them from the guards' view. After months of painstaking work, the inmates successfully widened the openings to fit their bodies marking the completion of the initial phase of their plan. However, their ultimate goal was not just to escape the confines of the prison, but also to leave the island, presenting a massive challenge considering they needed to travel across the sea. To address this, they devised a plan to construct a boat using materials at their disposal. Inspiration struck when they came across an article in a mechanics magazine detailing how to fashion a rubber boat and life jackets from raincoats, which were plentiful within the prison. With the assistance of fellow inmates, they collected and stole 50 raincoats. A dilemma arose regarding where to store and assemble these items. The only available space was on the roof of their cells, the very area where Alan West had discovered the ventilation duct opening. However, guards regularly monitored this location while overseeing inmate activities. Employing cunning tactics, West, under the guidance of Morris, devised a clever ruse West convinced the guards of the necessity to cover the bars above the cells with blankets and sheets to prevent dust from falling during cleaning. By continually demonstrating the dust issue and proposing a solution, West gained permission to cover the bars, effectively concealing their workshop from view. This security lapse was a glaring oversight for a prison renowned for its fortified structure. Despite its significance, it remained absent from primary reports and only surfaced in 1990 two decades after the event, highlighting the extent of the scandal surrounding Alcatraz's security breach. The blankets and sheets remained attached to the bars, concealing the workshop for a period of two months. During this time, the inmates took turns ascending to the makeshift workshop to construct the rubber boat and life jackets and cut the rods on the ventilation duct opening. They transformed the area into a fully equipped workshop by bringing up all the necessary tools. However, their lengthy absence from their cells posed a risk, as guards conducted sudden inmate checks. To overcome this threat, they devised a clever solution, creating fake heads to deceive the guards into believing they were sleeping. All their work was conducted at night, so they placed the fake heads on their pillows and covered them with blankets. When guards conducted checks, they observed what appeared to be a head on each pillow and moved on to the next cell, unaware of the inmate's absence. Actual photographs of these fake heads 
are still preserved in the prison archives, creating the fake heads required. Their resourcefulness knew no bounds as they utilized materials readily available in their cells, including soap, cement dust from the digging process, toilet paper paste, and dyes obtained from the prison workshop. Mixing these materials together, they fashioned convincing replicas of their heads. The only challenging aspect was simulating the appearance of hair, a task made easier by Clarence Anglin, one of the inmates who worked in the prison barbershop. Clarence played a key role in providing hair for the fake heads, bringing quantities of prisoners' hair until they had enough for all the replicas. With their preparations complete, the inmates continued their nightly rotations in their secret workshop diligently working on the rubber boat and life jackets over the course of two months. Finally, the night of June 11th, 1962, arrived, the night of the great prison break. As the prison lights were extinguished at 9.30 p.m., the four inmates began executing their escape plan. Each placed their fake head on their bed and covered it with a blanket to deceive the guards. They then opened the ventilation openings they had carefully dug over the preceding months and proceeded to the back corridor of their cells, leading to their workshop and ultimately to the ventilation duct opening that would grant them access to the prison roof. However, despite their meticulous planning, only three of the inmates managed to exit their cells successfully. Alan West encountered difficulty opening his ventilation opening, as the cement he used to cover the hole had hardened over time making it challenging to dig through. Again, the three other men, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, urged Alan to keep trying to follow them as soon as possible while they continued moving forward. As they progressed, they prepared the rubber boat and life jackets, removing the steel rods from the ventilation duct opening. Despite their preparations, Alan remained trapped in his cell, unable to join them. According to their prior agreement, if any member encountered difficulties, the others would proceed without hesitation. Thus, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers pressed on, successfully reaching the prison roof. Quietly, they navigated to the prison walls, which consisted of fences they easily cut through before making their way to the beach. At the beach, they utilized an instrument belonging to Frank Morris, modified to produce only air without noise, to inflate their boat. By 7 a.m., the prison wake-up bell rang, initiating the morning count. Guards discovered the fake head in Frank Morris' cell, triggering an immediate alarm. A thorough search operation began involving the authorities and the FBI. Allen, being unable to escape his cell, was questioned first. While apparently cooperative, it was suspected he withheld information regarding his fellow escapees' plans. After reaching San Francisco, despite extensive searches of the island and surrounding areas, no trace of the escapees was found indicating they had successfully entered the sea with their boat. Despite questioning other inmates, none were willing to provide useful information to the authorities. The search effort expanded gradually, becoming one of the largest conducted by the FBI. However, despite extensive efforts, no trace of the three inmates was found. The complex nature of the Alcatraz prison break rendered it successful, albeit unresolved. The investigation persisted for 15 years under the FBI's scrutiny before being handed over to local authorities. The official conclusion reached by the FBI was that the inmates had drowned at sea. However, doubts lingered regarding this conclusion. The primary evidence supporting the theory of their demise was the discovery of bags made from materials similar to those used for the raincoats used in crafting their rubber boats and life jackets. Inside these bags were found life jackets, but the boat itself remained elusive. Additionally, the bags contained photos and letters attributed to the Anglin brothers, including images of them and their families along with letters exchanged during their time in prison. The sentimental value attached to these possessions suggested that the brothers would not willingly discard them unless faced with dire circumstances, such as dying in the ocean. As Josh tours the prison, he is taken aback by all the new information he acquires, walking down the prison block where the infamous escape happened. He is shown Frank Morris' cell and informed that the brothers are further down the block. This astonishes him, as he still cannot understand how it was possible for the escapees to come up with a plan while they were at such distances from each other. Josh is then locked in one of the cells to experience what the inmates went through, feeling caged in that small space. He is shown the tunnels the escapees used to exit their cells and go to the workshop where they were making life jackets and rafts. He is then shown the route presumed to be the one the escapees took to get to the ocean. 
The exciting part of Josh's visit is when he gets to see the items in the FBI's possession that have been used by the inmates to aid in their escape. He notes that many of their ideas, including the life vests, were inspired by literature found in the prison library, particularly old issues of popular mechanics. Josh feels that this situation underscores the importance of further education, as it truly can pave the way to freedom. One of the highlights of Josh's tour is seeing the actual fake Van Grates, carefully handmade from layers of cardboard, soap, and paint, serving to cover the deteriorating concrete surrounding the air duct, blending seamlessly with the paint color of the prison wall. Witnessing this level of do-it-yourself crafting in a prison setting is quite remarkable. The inmates dedicated around six months to their craft, using spoons and discarded blades to chisel away at the concrete in their cells. They even fashioned a handmade periscope to secretly check for guards, showcasing their resourcefulness akin to MacGyver. The small mirror embedded in the periscope allowed them to peer around corners and possibly check the prison rooftop before making their final escape. Additionally, they ingeniously repurposed a vacuum cleaner motor into a drill, highlighting their inventive problem-solving skills. Josh's last stop is by the replica heads that the inmates placed on their beds to deceive the guards while they worked at the workshop. He is impressed by how realistic they look and admits that they could fool anyone, especially at night. However, he notices that there are four heads, while the escapees are three. This is where he is informed of the initial plan that included four escapees, but one was left behind. As Josh finishes his tour, he realizes that the prison, rumored to be the most secure in the world, definitely had its weaknesses, and the three escapees who made it out prove that. However, it is unfortunate that the three men have never been spotted, as their story would make an epic movie.